and thank you so much for attending today. This is going to be a webinar with Dennis Urban, CDT, on protocol procedures and patient acceptance with implant dentures. Again, Dennis is a general manager and technical advisor with Dental Services Group. He's also an internationally recognized speaker and author. And with that, I'm away, Dennis. Hey, thank you, uh, Jessica, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us today on a webinar. Uh, today, we're going to discuss protocol, procedure, and patient acceptance with implant dentures, and we're going to be covering um, over-denture cases, and then we'll get to the uh, hybrid-type uh, screw-retained dentures uh, and later on in the presentation. So, in case you want to put a face to the, uh, to the name and the voice here, this is me. Uh, my name is Dennis Urban, uh, over 40 years' experience in dental technology, and I've had the opportunity to lecture on this topic uh, worldwide, and um, it's a it's a growing technology. Um, it's it's a technology that um, uh, we've seen evolve, just like on the digital side. And today we're going to talk about science, technique, and application with uh, implant over dentures and uh, implant uh, hybrid dentures. As you can see, we'll we'll, mention, we'll talk about bar design, attachment uh, attachment uh, selection. Root, uh, root selection with uh, implants and, and uh, these types of cases here, root, root type of cases. And, and then we have also uh, adult bar cases, and we'll talk about hybrid uh, cases, chair side uh, conversions. And the important thing is the right materials and techniques to use on these types of cases, and, and most importantly is communication. Where are we going with denture technology, especially on the implant side? Well, the majority of the United States labs surveyed claim they had a dramatic increase in implant denture cases in the last five years. Um, and dentists who like to increase their, increase their implant denture and hybrid businesses over 70%. So there's a lot of income opportunity out there for, for dentists, clinicians, oral surgeons, and dental laboratories. Uh, so the, the, uh, it, it's out there, the income and the opportunities for dental laboratories, technicians, dentists, dentists and dental manufacturers also. But the key is communication. On these cases, we must communicate, correct, uh, communicate correctly on these cases in order to have a successful case. We depend on the uh, communication between the dentist, the surgeon, and the periodontist, and the clinical knowledge and training, the as assessment of the patient, the appropriate treatment planning, detailed RX and work authorization forms, digital photography, and of course, the correct materials. And on our side, from the certified dental technician, you depend on our technical expertise, with knowledge and procedures and materials, the appropriate feedback on dentists to dentists on impressions, bites, shades, et cetera, and case planning with the dentist and the oral surgeon. And of course, we like to get digital photography on every case and advice on proper case planning. So let's talk about the uh, implant dentures now. And we'll start with uh, implant over dentures. And we want to get the ultimate result. You know, there are a number of advantages uh, that the overdentures have over complete dentures. You know, many clinicians believe that complete dentures are not an appropriate, or, or appropriate restoration and instead believe that the minimum standard of care should be, you know, two implants on an overdenture. Uh, and with the many implant and attachment systems on the market, the cost of an implant overdenture has become very affordable. Whether we have natural teeth, roots, or implants, we tend to retain the bone in those areas. This is one of the most important benefits of overdentures when compared to complete, complete dentures. And patients who are restored with overdentures chew more effectively and have more comfort. And for the patient, it raises their confidence level, self-esteem, knowing they'll be able to eat most foods and have a stable denture and not have to use adhesive. I'd like to uh, put this uh, statement here uh, by Dr. Massad. He says, the removable implant overdenture has become well-established uh, option, if not the most preferred for the dentalist patient. Critical to the success of this procedure is not only an accurate impression of the implant abutments, but also extreme vital, uh, extremely vital is the detail of the entire edentulous ridges, the peripheral borders uh, to main stability, retention, and deflect unwanted food and entrapment around denture margins. So this is very important and pretty much we're going through the basics here. You know, we need to follow the basics in order to get a su successful case uh, on the implant over dentures. But 20 million Americans are edentulists, and undergraduate programs across the country realize that two implants for lower overdentures are the recommended treatment choice over leaving somebody fully edentulist. And the amount of bone loss and dentistry as seen, as seen in fully edentulist patients during the past generations is frightening to consider. And dentistry has thought that bone atrophy was normal years ago. We now know that two implants and the anterior mandible will stop this progressive bone loss and preserve the ridge. 
Some of the implant uh, overdenture purposes, we want to create natural aesthetics, enhance facial appearance, compensate for lost soft tissue, enhance the function with the right occlusal scheme, and we'll talk about lingualized occlusion in a little while. And most patients can afford one type of implant overdenture since they are less expensive than a fixed prosthesis. Indications for over, uh, implant overdenture is compromised support on the conventional denture, poor neuromuscular coordination, this includes uh, occlusion, low tolerance of mucosal tissues for removal of uh, acrylic baits, sore spots are involved in this and uh, a lot of adjustments, patient dissatisfaction with complete dentures and the desire for more stability and comfort, and congenital or, and oral defects that need oral rehabilitation. And like Jessica mentioned, I have an article, a two-part uh, two article I'll talk about uh, later on in the seminar, and it really in, involves in the, uh, the topic of congenital, uh, congenital and oral defects. So let's look at the three basic types of implant overdentures. We have one mainly tissue-supported overdenture with two prefabricated individual attachments that are utilized, and the overdenture is mainly tissue-borne. Tissue implant-supported overdentures where more implant borns compared to the previous type and two implants and a resilient bar assembly uh, should be utilized. And then we have the fully supported implant overdenture, an attachment assembly that usually contains four or more implants. And the attachment assembly transfers all the forces to the supporting implants and minimal flange and tissue coverage is required. Some of the uh, deciding factors, again, we, met, we mentioned some of these earlier, uh, soreness and discomfort with the denture base. We wanna make sure there's enough bone quantity when we're doing these implant overdentures and discuss uh, the expectations for the uh, treatment outcome with the patient and expected oral uh, hygiene and patient compliance. We look at the jaw relationship. What's the uh, intraocclusal space we have to make these types of appliances? The distance between the upper and lower alveolar ridge, very important to consider. And the expertise and dentist of the dentist and the lab technician and the communication between all of us, the surgeon, dentist, lab technician, and periodontist, and also the implant company. Some of the common mistakes in, in constructing implants supported over dentures is poor treatment and planning, distorted final impression, inaccurate model work, as well as working model, poor fitting frameworks, and the wrong choice of materials and attachments. And we'll talk about attachments in a few minutes. A successful implant supported over denture, we want a stress-free uh, fit of the attachment assembly, good oral hygiene, biocompatibility of the chosen materials, high biomechanical strength of the chosen materials, and that includes acrylic. And we'll talk about um, acrylic in, in a little while also, with the high flexural strength and high impact resistance for these types of cases. We want functional and equilibrated occlusion, and the occlusion of choice in these types of dentures are lingualized occlusion, natural looking aesthetics, and the absence of interference with normal phonetics. So what do we, how do we choose with or without a bar? Well, a bar can achieve evenly distributed forces between the implants. The direct method of overdenture attachments incorporated into the denture base without a mill bar costs less and requires less vertical room. The final case uh, uh, design is determined by what we have to work with intraorally. We have the amount of space, uh, enough bone density. But both methods require support from the tissue and the attachments. Keep in mind that the denture rests on the soft tissue and the attachments act only as a retentive element, preventing the denture from dislodging. So let's look at some of the advantages of overdentures. We spoke a little bit about that earlier. You know, once we int introduce attachments into, into the case design, we gain three ad additional advantages. The overdenture will become more stable than the complete denture, which leads to greater comfort and better aesthetics. Now you'll be able to de determine how occlusal forces are handled and you'll be able to have the choice of uh, a rigid and resilient attachments from which to choose. Therefore, you can choose if the overdenture will be, be supported by abutments or if the ridge will handle more of the load and then we can also achieve superior aesthetics. We're no longer relying on a closed pallet and heavy extended flanges to hold the denture in place. We must be sure that the flanges do not engage any tissue undercuts more than about one millimeter. And we'll shorten the flanges slightly so they don't create a different path of insertion than those indicated on the attachments. So let's look at some of the advantages like a method prevention, preserved bone, better chewing efficiency, peace of mind, stability, and comfort. And there's so many choices uh, for the patient on fixed and fixed removable solutions. And that's what we're, gonna, we're going to speak, be speaking about today. And I'll talk about uh, attachment choices in a few minutes also. Uh, but take a look at this photo here. This is on the left-hand side without a denture. You see how sunken in the patient's lip is? Now, even with an implant hyperdenture, the patient is still not filled out on a lip area. You know, uh, so in this particular case, we have an overdenture with a, a flange 
which makes the patient look more natural. So we had that transition zone that really needed to be filled in with acrylic and to fill out the patient's natural lip. So removable implant dentures, individual attachments versus of R or versus of R with attachments. How do we choose? With or without a bar. Well, the bar can achieve evenly distributed forces between the implants. You know, the direct method with overdenture attachments incorporated into the denture base without a mill bar costs less and requires less vertical room. The final case design is determined by what we have to work with on draw early, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, but both method, methods require support from tissue in the attachments. All right, so I just wanted to reiterate that on that, that, that this particular uh, implant overdenture uh, um, overview that we're doing, you know, and considerations with attachments only. Well, an ideal ridge structure is needed. For instance, a lower uh, full denture on a patient with an ideal ridge and good bone structure can easily have an overdenture attachments placed into the final denture without the use of a milled bar. But we want to make sure a metal substructure is placed internally for strength. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute also with um, uh, chrome cobalt strengtheners and some of the new polymers that are out there for, uh, we can utilize for strengtheners. An upper denture would be functional with just attachments if the patient's bite is in an ideal class one occlusion. Deciding factors for a bar assembly. You now often the anterior flange on the upper has mobility if the patient is not in an ideal occlusion. This causes a mesiodistal rock that can put all the stress on the attachments, and this is when we consider a mill bar assembly. You know, if the patient has a flat ridge, there will be no tissue support, although the pressure will be on the attachments. So if, if possible, a fixed case would be better in this instance. A bar with horizontal lock attachments acts as a sort of fixed patient removable prosthesis. So the protocol for overdentures, uh, first of all, we want to get a preliminary impression of the healing caps. Then we'll make a custom tray and get the final impression. We'll pour that model in the laboratory and the next step we'll make a bite rim, uh, rim for you, an occlusal rim. And if we're going to uh, make a bar, I would send along with the bite rim a verification jig so we can verify that the impression was, uh, was accurate. At this point, we would do setup for try-in and then we do insertion of the attachments and, and connection. That can be either done intraorally or chair side. Let's look at some of the attachment choices on the market. You know, probably one of the most uh, popular attachment systems are the locator attachments. And these, these work really well. They're consistent, they do the job, and uh, we utilize this a lot, these a lot at Dental Services Group also. There's many different kinds, you know, options with these. We have the cast two, root attachments, mill bars, implants. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, implants uh, that we can utilize. A lot of these we screw right into um, a mill bar. Uh, same with the other attachment systems on the market. ERA <laughs> attachments are still very popular. I'm so sorry, Dennis. This brings us to the first polling question. Which attachment system do you feel has the best results? The locator, ERA, the Rhine equator, or the Brendent? Am I saying that right? Uh, Brendent. Brendent attachment. Brendent. Yeah. Um, which attachment system do you feel has the best? And a couple more seconds. We'd love for your participation to know which attachment system do you feel has the best results? And so we don't take up too much time. It looks like 75% for the locator. Okay, good. Yeah, locator is popular. You know, there's so many attachment systems out there. I only listed four, there are probably about 50 of them out there. So, uh, but locator is a good reliable uh, uh, attachment system. Let's just close this out here. All right. So ERA attachments are still widely used. We, uh, we use quite a bit of ERA attachments also. And just give me a second here, my screen froze up here. Backwards. Technical difficulty here, we'll, we'll get started in a second. This tends to happen when we put up these polling questions. I'll save uh, the rest of them for the end then. Okay, yeah, no problem. Let's see if we can do. Yeah, not to... You wanna try dropping the screen share, closing it and re- Oh, here we go. Okay. I got it, yeah, thank you, yeah, thanks, it worked. I just gonna do that. Okay, so let's do that. So we're talking about ERA attachments um, and then we're going to uh, talk about actual cases here. This particular case is an ERA attachment case uh, where we have a bar, milled bar, assembly 
and we actually uh, drilled pilot holes into the bar for the ERA uh, uh, abutments. So as you can see, a beautiful impression. We put the impression couplings in there. We actually poured a soft tissue model on here, and then we uh, went ahead and milled the bar. And this is a nice case, but the thing that we want to make sure of is when we're doing these cases is that um, you know we want an internal metal substructure or a substructure, a strengthener. And as you can see on this case, we made a, a, a bar, an upper framework, a horseshoe type of framework, uh, which is going to open up the palate and give the patient some sensitivity when they taste, and it's going to feel a lot more comfortable in the mouth. So, you know, in processing these, what we'll do is we'll process the uh, attachments. In this case, the ERA, ERA attachments right onto the framework, uh, and then we'll process the dentures. So this worked out very well, and you can change these. There's different retentive values uh, with these types of attachments, and uh, it's going to be a stable denture. And you can see how nice this patient, how the patient looks, uh, the denture looks in the mouth here. So this is an ER, ERA attachment. Uh, with a mill bar assembly here. And one of my, one of my favorite attachment systems is the OT equator. It's a, th a three-in-one system. It's a cast, it has castable, just like the, uh, the locator attachments. It's castable, it's for implants, for mill bars. It's uh, compatible with all implant brands with cuff heights from one to seven millimeters with a two millimeter thread. So we will do a lot is we'll have that thread drilled into the bar and we'll utilize those uh, abutments in, the, in these cases. But it's just a little smaller profile. So if you don't, you're limited on room on these types of cases, uh, this is a good attachment to go with. So it's a little smaller profile than the, the uh, uh, locator. As you can see here, a little different size. You know, this, uh, that, this small amount of size can make uh, a, a difference, you know, when you, especially when you're grinding teeth and there's not much room, you know. So when you're grinding teeth, you want to make sure you can maintain the integrity of the, of the uh, shade by using correct teeth. But sometimes we just don't have that room if we use a large, um, a larger attachment system. So you, you can see the OT equator system. This, these uh, attachments are being uh, actually processed uh, chair side in this particular case. And there's the differences between the two sizes. The retempted values are very, very close uh, to each other from the equator compared to the locator. And this is a pit, one particular overbar denture case that I did a few years back, which uh, had another laboratory call me up and he just was having so much trouble with this case and a model work and uh, the verification index was done before I, I got the case. But uh, basically we tried in the verification index, we saw everything was good on this and we, we, we had the bite registration and we did a, a denture setup. And then uh, we had an inner uh, strengthener made. And uh, this is the bar design that we did with the four uh, equator attachments. So this worked out very well, this case here. And you can see on the denture try-in, I incorporated the, um, the, the uh, strengthener, this uh, uh, chrome cobalt strengthener on here. And I, I actually processed the attachments to the, uh, the framework. The try-in went very well. There's the finished denture processed and ready to go. That's, that worked out, that was a very nice denture with, uh, 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 with the uh, Ryan 83 attachments. And that's just one of the many scenarios you can utilize these for. And as far as the framework strengtheners go, I'd say about 80, 90% of the time we're using uh, cast chrome cobalt strengtheners. Uh, but now there's some new materials out there now uh, on, the, on the market and they're called super polymers. You know, there's called peak material. There's, uh, uh, there's various other strengtheners out there that are probably a little bit more aesthetic. And, the strength, and strength wise, they pretty much do the same, same job as a metal, metal uh, framework would do. So you have a lot of options, but you want to make sure that you do utilize um, uh, a strengthener inside these over dancers because I would say 95% of the time, you're going to get breakage right near the attachment. What if you have divergency issues? You know, even with the locator, they have uh, attachment systems uh, with the locator to uh, compensate for this. With uh, this is the Ryan 83, um, uh, it's called a smart box and it's up to about 30 degrees of um, a divergency, as you can see, it's a rotational cap that they utilize. You can see on the right hand side, it's rotating, compensating for the divergency in these implants. Because not every implant is, uh, is angled uh, perfectly. So, this is a great option also. And there's other systems out there that utilize this, the, uh, many other attachment systems that utilize this um, divergency issue and, and for, to take care of the divergency issues that are out there. So, so let's look at some of the mill bars. Um, we have, of course, um, this is a locator bar over here. There's another uh, mill bar with locator, and these, these, these bars come back beautifully. They come back uh, looking like pieces of jewelry. There's a dolda bar. We don't do too many dolda bars anymore. We probably do more of the hater clips. Sometimes we do a combination on the anterior with a hater clip and then uh, locator, 
and or RIN-83 attachments on the posterior region. So that's just a little synopsis of some of the um, uh, overdenture cases and some of the scenarios and, and the protocol for those. And now we're gonna talk about getting into growing your removal business with immediate load cases. All on four, all on six. So there's a lot of uh, different uh, views on these types of cases here. We do quite a bit of these and you know, I, I'd like a, uh, I like six implants rather than a four. I feel more safer that when case one fails, we have another five. And with all four, because of the angulated implants, if one fails, you could be in trouble. So I like at least six implants on these types of cases. So we're going to go through some of the um, protocol and procedure on these cases here. So with the all on four type of case, there's a tilted implant with four implants. And the posterior most implants are tilted at 45 degrees or less. It's a graftless procedure, and bone grafting is avoided by tilting the posterior implants, utilizing available bone. Immediate function, the fixed provisional denture or implants are for patients meeting criteria for immediate load of, of implants. The patient has to meet that criteria. And if you're doing vertical implants with six or more implants, sinus grafting may be, next, uh, may be necessary. So there's no, no need to angle those, uh, any in the implants when you're doing six or more. So let's look at the all-on-four all on treatment facts. And these are proven facts. They're proven long-term solutions with high survival rates. The all-on-four treatment concept is a proven long-term solution with up to 10 years follow-up in the mandible and five years in the maxilla. And cumulative uh, survival rates are high in both the intentional maxilla and the mandible. Midterm is three to four years, 96.3 to 100%. Long-term is five to 10 years, up to 98%. Favorable bone and uh, soft tissue parameters are also uh, uh, proved, proved to be in these, in these cases. And the stable marginal bone levels and healthy soft tissue for both tilted and actually implants on both all in four and all in six. And you can see in uh, this uh, panoramic view here with an X-ray of the upper and lower with uh, these tilted implants on an all in four case. And most of the time we're utilizing multi-unit abutments on these types of cases. And uh, the multi-unit abutment is caref carefully designed to rehabilitate the, both the dentulous and partially dentulous, ar dentulous arches. And, um, and it's clinically proven on the all on floor treatment concept. And they're carefully designed. There's a lot of choices to choose from, you know, with the, there's short cones for limited and interocclusal space, uh, wider shoulder for easier positioning of the prosthetic restoration, and for various soft tissue anatomies that it's angled from 17 to 30 degrees. And this can also help with that divergency issue. And this is a great tool that we utilize a lot. It's the multi-unit aligning instrument and you can get this through, through Nobel. And uh, it delivers efficiency through, through versatility as three angulation indications to help you choose the correct uh, multi-unit abutment. And multi-unit abutments can be tricky. You know, we really want to, we need to get them in the right position. I've seen so many different instances where we're working in the lab on the model, we have everything in, in, in the right place and in the, uh, in the panel office, there's some uh, issues with getting them in the, uh, in the right position. So we usually uh, have some sort of verification jig that we send along to the panel office. So you can position these correctly and orally. So what is the dental laboratory's role? Well, we have the case, case planning uh, with you, uh, the clinician on implants, the denture type, and occlusion, case planning with the oral surgeon, the dentist, and the implant company, and, and the periodontist, and in-office support on the day of surgery with uh, the denture conversion, and future case planning with the mill bar prosthesis. The day of surgery, we, we arrive at the office if you want us to be there, and we'll assist you with a step-by-step -step procedure in converting a removable prosthesis to a, a screw-retained denture. And this is, it's, you know, it's a simple uh, uh, application. You know, we'll do, we'll, we'll bring, if, if it's immediate denture, we'll have that immediate denture made already for you. If it's an existing denture that the patient has, we can also convert that over to a screw retained temporary provisional. So the first thing we'll do is fill that provisional prosthesis with a heavy body v to BPS material, or I, I like a medium body, but uh, uh, it's a you know, personal preference. And we'll set the prosthesis in the mouth and we'll make sure the dental midline is consistent with the facial midline. We'll re remove the denture, and the locations of the abutments have been recorded in the impression. So it tells us exactly where those temporary cylinders are gonna be placed. We're gonna drill those holes into the prosthesis at the abutment uh, locations, 
identified in the impression. And we're going to drill each hole larger than the diameter of the low profile abutments or the temporary cylinders. So uh, I start out small and I start making a little bit larger and I want a nice passive fit. So we'll put this in the mouth and intra orally, make sure there's a nice passive fit that all those uh, temporary cylinders come through easily. You place those temporary cylinders, and make sure everything is completed, completely seated onto the abutment. And then we'll put the denture over the abutment, so uh, the temporary cylinders. And at this point, you know, if everything's passive and we're ready to process these temporary cylinders, and I'll take a little marker, a little Sharpie, and we'll, we'll mark those temporary cylinders right at the occlusal point. Uh, so there's no interference when the patient bites down and we start, when we start to cure these uh, temporary cylinders into place. So we'll take those temporary cylinders out, I'll cut them down, we'll put them back, make sure they're seated, and now we're ready to get that patient into that screw-retained uh, temporary denture. And most of the time, in the rubber uh, damage is being used, um, especially in the past when there was acrylic being used to cure these temporary cylinders. Now there's some great materials out there where you don't have to worry about the material running all over the mouth or uh, locking things in. Um, and I'm going to show that material in a second. So, so now we're ready to, uh, to cure and oral polymerize around all the temporary cylinders. The, the, the material that I like the best out there is called quick up material. And I don't get anything for saying this. It's, it's just, I, I talk about what works and what's been successful. And instead of using cold cure or acrylic, I'm utilizing this uh, quick up material. And I'm injecting this auto cure material around each, each cylinder. So if we're doing an all on four type of case, I would probably do all four, all four cylinders. You know, I have the doctor do all the four, all four cylinders and have the patient bite down. And it cures in about two to three minutes. So it's a, fast, it's a fair, pretty fast cure. Uh, if there's anything more than four, four temporary um, cylinders, I would actually do maybe three at a time, three, or, uh, three at a time, then do another three. I've seen some bad situations in the dental office where uh, the clinician would try to do all six at one time, the material sets up, and the patient can't bite down correctly, and then we have to drill out and grind out all those temporary cylinders. So it's important probably to do about three or four at a time. And with this material, which is great about this, if you miss any area around those temporary cylinders with the quick, quick cut material, if you take it out of the mouth and look at the tissue side, if there's any voids on that tissue side, you can also add to it with a quick, uh, quick up like cure material, which like cure is in about 30 to 40 seconds. It's a very strong material, can be polished, can be, can be ground down without any problem, and it's color stable. So this is one of my best, mater best materials I, I like to use when we're doing chair side conversions. And then at this point, we take everything out of the mouth and I'll cut out, if it's an upper denture, I'll cut out the palate, I'll remove the flanges, the buckle flanges, make it nice and smooth all the way around. I'll uh, have a little space between the, the denture uh, and, the, and the tissue, and we'll polish everything nice, nicely, and then the dentist can uh, screw this in the mouth and have this patient wear this for the next six months. And of course, checking uh, the, the case intermittently to make sure it's fine. Here's a couple of uh, intra oral photos with uh, here's the five implants on a lower that the doctor is doing, utilizing a um, um, uh, rubber dam. And these are cured in the mouth, intra orally, patient fit down, everything was nice, everything fit perfectly. So uh, uh, there's the upper denture and a lower denture conversion is done in the office. And you'll see that this dentist is really happy about this, uh, this case. He's got this bottle of champagne ready to celebrate. And it is a great feeling when they, you know, these things, they, 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 you know, if you do everything correctly with case planning and follow the procedures and write materials and they get that support from all around, it is a great feeling to see that patient happy and able to function and walk in at an office with a screw retained denture. And then some of the things we're working on uh, as far as printed technology for hybrid transitionals, uh, we are able now to print these, this, these denture-based material and actually print the uh, denture teeth and have all these uh, access holes drilled out for you beforehand, utilizing um, our, our surgical guides uh, in the software. So there's a lot of things we, we're doing now, which probably could, you know, might eliminate us from being chair side, and make you a little, more, a little more comfortable, a clinician a little more comfortable with doing this uh, without any support chair side. But we're always there for support as far as chair side goes. But you can see from here, we utilize the surgical guide for all the uh, access holes, and then we printed the teeth and the denture base. So this is something that we're doing right now. It's great technology, and we're excited about it. So, so let's talk about a little more in depth about these hybrid dentures. Again, patient expectations. It's really important on, on patient expectations. 
to give them the correct expectations, what they're going to be facing, how long they're going to be in a temporary indenture, what are the, what are the choices uh, when they're ready to go move on after six months, possibly six or eight months, uh, on to a hybrid type case, whether it be a denture case or a fixed case with Crown and Bridge case. So, uh, so it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of options out there. But let's look at the relative functional capacity of lower jaw. You know, with all natural teeth, we have 100% jaw, jaw capacity or chewing capacity. If you go down a little bit more on an implant form, form bridge, it's about 90%. And as we go into an overdenture, it goes down to 60 or 63% uh, on the average uh, when it's tissue borne. And look at the lower denture. There's about 10% functional jaw capacity on a lower denture. And so that's why we've seen so many problems over the years with, with lower dentures. Uh, and you know, without any teeth, of course, zero zero capacity. So this is a great chart. I like to show this a lot because it gives you a, gives you a better idea how much more, how closer we are with an implant form bridge or a hybrid type case to all natural teeth morphology and, and, and function. So let's look at some, some of these special considerations uh, with the, uh, these types of cases. Some of the requirements for an implant prosthesis, adequate bone volume, as like I mentioned earlier in, in the presentation, bone, bite, uh, bone height has to be a little bit more to allow uh, about 12 millimeters to allow for at least 10 millimeters of implants length. This includes residual bone after the tooth extractions. And a bone width uh, more than six millimeters to allow for uh, at least four millimeters diameter of the implants. So uh, limited grafting can be accomplished at the time of the implant placement. So adequate bone quantity is, is, is essential. You know, I, you know, many, I, I must have been about five or six years ago, I was lecturing, uh, going around lecturing around the country with a, with a dentist and, and a surgeon, and they used to show in their presentations all the failed implants they've seen throughout their uh, experience throughout the years in different dental offices. And, and, and it's amazing how these, some of these dental implants were placed in, in uh, inadequate bone when they have an inadequate bone quantity. And it's kind of scary. So we want to make sure that's, uh, that's going to be a prerequisite for these, these types of cases. Requirements for an implant prosthesis, adequate restorative volume, like I mentioned before, the adequate AP spread for optimal positioning on implants. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the adequate coverage of the lip or, or transition zone. Treatment for cautions. System, system, systemic health complications, including, uh, including uh, bleeding disorders, metabolic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension. We all have to watch out for that when we're, we're, we're um, uh, prescribing these types of cases and a compromised in immune system. Parafunctional habits and, of course, bone, for bone quantity. Okay, let's talk about the AP spread. You know, edentulous patients expect posterior first molar occlusion. And uh, treatment planning, uh, the position of the implants and, and following the protocol of the AP or anterior or posterior, or posterior spread can achieve this result. So what we do here is you can see uh, that line through the center of the anterior most implant. We draw a line and we measure the distance in millimeters between the anterior implant and the most posterior implants. And then we take the measurement and multiply it by 1.5. This number offers you the distance that the teeth can be cantilevered off the most distal implant. So AP spread is very important. And many times on the, um, the design software, and now on bar design software, it takes this into consideration for you and uh, has this uh, evaluation already done for you. But this is the rule of thumb when it comes to uh, anterior posterior spread. And restorative space, we wanna make sure we have more, enough restorative space. I think we have enough on this, this, this photo here, restoring this, these, uh, these cases here. Uh, this is gonna be a full mouth reconstruction here. But we want to make sure we have the right restorative space. And you know, I'll show in the next couple of slides the amount of amount of space that we need for acrylic and, and teeth and bars and implants and attachments and things like that. It's 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 important. So this is a great slide. The adequate restorative volume that provides space for implant restorative components and prosthesis is about 12 to 15 millimeters. I would love to get 15 millimeters. Uh, I would love to have four millimeters of acrylic on there, but sometimes we just don't have that amount of space. We wanna make sure we're pretty close to this 12 to 15 millimeters. And as you can see here, there's a breakdown of all that, uh, that space that we need from the abutments all the way to the denture teeth. And the transitional line, you know, we talked about transitional lines before. It's a junction between the natural paint uh, gingiva and the artificial bank by on um, the denture, uh, by the lip, mobility, smile line, the amount of bone, the size of teeth. So, you know, certain cases when we are not going to be able to do 
uh, and make a hybrid type case because of these transitional zones. It'll probably, the patient will probably be better off with an overdenture case so we can, we can fill in that area where the transitional uh, zone is meant to be filled in with acrylic to mimic tissue. And how about tissue contact? You know, tissue contact, some people, uh, you know, I try to give about a millimeter of space between the, uh, on these hybrid cases, between the uh, acrylic and the tissue. But this particular case here, you can see what happened. This is an allergic reaction the patient had to the acrylic uh, onto the tissue uh, contact. So we have to be cognizant of that. You know, sometimes the dentist uh, or the clinician asks me to just leave it and they, they want to relieve this area themselves, uh, and I do that. But on an average, it's about a millimeter space between the uh, acrylic and the, um, and the ginger. And on an average, as far as uh, you know, opportunity for income here, on an average, the total patient fee is about $27,000 for these types of cases. So uh, you take into consideration also the surgical fee and the restorative fee, but totally, it's anywhere, and the average uh, around this country, the average fee is about $26,000 to $27,000. So that's, that's a, nice, a nice profit. You know, we'd like to get a, a number of these cases in, in your offices uh, on, on, a, on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. But, uh, but it's a, aside from the profit here, it's a great way to restore uh, these edentulous patients. So let's talk about the protocol on these implant uh, hybrid type cases. First of all, we get a preliminary impression from the uterine clinician and we make a custom tray. And then we'll uh, take this, so you'll take the second impression and um, either do a closed impression or an open tray impression. We'll pour a master cast with soft tissue. And the next thing on the next visit, what we're going to be sending you is the verification index and the base plate and bite rim. And normally what I'll do in the base plate and bite rim, I'll put at least one to two temporary cylinders so you can stabilize that base plate plate on the ridge so nothing moves around. Everything comes back to us correctly and everything is great on the verification index. We'll do a tooth setup and the tooth setup looks great. And then we're ready to send this out to the uh, milling facility. And we'll talk about the different facilities in a little while. And then you'll have a, you know, we'll, do, um, we'll send the um, tooth setup, soft tissue model, and a putty index to the, uh, this facility. And in a matter of days or you know, three or four days, we'll get back from these facility, whether it be Nobel, Biomed Simmer, Panthera, we'll get a verification JPEG. And with this verification JPEG, and it'll give us an idea how, where that bar is sitting, how much space we have, is there enough space between the tissue and the, and the, and the bar, or the denture teeth and the acrylic, and so forth. So we get to look at all different angles of these, uh, these verification JPEGs, and then we'll approve it. And if it looks good, we'll approve it, and then we'll get that, uh, that bar sent back to the laboratory. And for the last time, we just want to do one final try-in with the bar and the denture, denture teeth. So we'll do a try-in with the bar and denture teeth. I'll show you how I do that in a second. And then if everything looks good, we're ready to process and finish for delivery. So this is your average protocol on, the, uh, on hybrid type cases. And to review, first we're fabricating a soft tissue master cast from the impression. There's our verification index and then the cool from rim. Verify the, verify the cast is correct. And take your occlusal records. And on these occlusal records, especially if it's an upper we want to make sure that we get the correct information. We want to uh, midline, cuspid line, high lift line, and smile line on these, and, uh, and utilize those temporary cylinders to keep this, this bite registration in place. And this particular material here I used, and uh, I, I mentioned these because these, this works best for me. Uh, you might utilize some other materials out there. This is the Primatex splint material. The Primatex splint material is a great material for verifi verification indexes because of the uh, minimal shrinkage and expansion on these, on these types. So I, what I'll do is just wrap it around temporary cylinders and then I'll put it in the uh, lecture unit for about three minutes and I have my verification index. And if you need to adjust it in the office, if it's not fitting correctly or the, uh, accurate, if the impression wasn't accurate, we can cut that verification index and loot it together with either some, uh, some pattern resin, Duralay, or some more of this lectured material. So now the teeth are set up, everything looks good. The teeth are set up for the denture uh, try-in. And I just want to touch on denture setups for a few, few minutes here, some of the importance of denture and setting denture teeth. I'm not going to go into every single detail, but I just want to talk, talk about the basics. First of all, I always like to use it on these types of full mouth rehabilitation cases, either fully adjustable articulators or semi-adjustable articulators. And now we want to set our denture teeth. How do we select anterior teeth? Well, facial form equals tooth form. And look at this though, as we're dividing the face here. There's your pupil line, which equals the occlusal plane. 
we have the, your lift line or your smile line. We have our midline, and all this we're going to get information. A lot of this is going to be given to us on the on the um, on the occlusal rim, on the upper occlusal rim. We have our cuspid lines, and then we have to determine the mold. We can look at the shape of the arch of the upper arch, and usually the shape of the upper arch is pretty pretty similar to the shape of the uh, the centrals. You have an ovoid arch. You're going to have an ovoid central, a square arch. It's going to be a square central, or we if we have a study model of uh, an existing denture, this also works well. Or we can measure the, the width of, uh, from the cuspid to cuspid lines on the pipe block and, and, uh, and we'll get a measurement and then we'll go to the um, uh, tooth chart and I'll give us a measurement what kind of what size denture teeth to use. So there's a lot of different uh, determining factors here on how to pick out denture teeth. Our concerns, the width of the six anteriors, the shape of the anteriors, shape of the centrals, and of course the shade. I mentioned earlier, tooth form equals facial form, square face, square tooth, and so on. Again, Square tapering tooth, square face, tapering face. So usually facial form equals uh, tooth form. So, and look at the natural anatomical landmarks we have to go by. You know, if you look at the tips of the canines, usually they're equal to the width of the nose. And you look at the width of the centrals, usually equal to the width of the filtrum. We want to set the entry teeth to be harmonious and aesthetic and natural looking. And then we're going to set up our, 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 our anteriors. Before we do that, I just want to mention, you know, we talk about these, uh, these high dollar cases here, you know, uh, and the patient's spending a lot of money, we're spending a lot of time planning and working on these cases. We want to use the correct denture teeth. And there are a lot of denture teeth to choose from out on the market. We want to use denture teeth that are going to be homogenous material throughout the whole tooth, have high mechanical strength, that are tissue friendly, plaque resistant, color stable, and ship free. You know, there's many denture teeth out there where you start adjusting the occlusion They'll go through one of the first layer and get through a softer layer after that. And that's, that's not right because it's not going to work out for the patient, especially on these cases. And it's been a proven fact that with these types of cases, when patients chew and grind, the denture teeth wear out faster on these types of cases, hybrid cases, and even implant or denture cases. So we want to get something that's going to be a microfilled reinforced polyacrylic. And this is, uh, I like to use Vita teeth or even um, uh, Ivoclar teeth. Even Colza has a great tooth also. So we wanted the same size as natural teeth, high wear resistance, and I like to utilize lingual anatomy for better phonetics on these cases because patients have some times with the phonetics, especially on, on upper dentures. So as you can see here, this particular case, I had lingual, uh, lingual anatomy on, uh, on these denture teeth uh, with the rugae. And we don't have to worry too much about that on the, uh, uh, with the rugae on the um, uh, implant hybrid cases, but uh, it, is, it, it does help in uh, phonetics. We want a wider occlusal space on our um, uh, on posterior teeth. You know, it's great for chewing and grinding. You know, I, I'd rather use something like this than a, a zero degree or a five degree tooth. We want something with translucency, opalescence, and fluorescence, as well as uh, uh, whitest and sizal edges for a more natural look and a great emergence profile. So the patient can have a beautiful aesthetic uh, functional case when we're finished. So right now we're going to set our upper and lower anterior denture teeth. We want the anteriors positioned individually and parallel to the pupil line. And those lower incisal edges are going to be parallel to the incisal edges. And um, as you can see here. And you know, as I do my denture set of courses around the country, I, I see a lot of dental technicians setting denture teeth against the ridge. But I usually come out about eight to 10 millimeters from the papilla when I'm setting denture teeth or I follow the guidelines that the clinician has given me on the bite mark. So if you look at that upper photo here, this is a minimum, uh, minimum ridge absorption on here. So we're able to come out about eight to 10 millimeters from the filler on this type of case. But we have, we have maximum ridge absorption like on the lower one. If you set those denture teeth against that ridge, the patient's lip is gonna be sunk, sunken in and their emergence profile is not gonna be correct. And, and as far as the aesthetics, it's not gonna look uh, like a aesthetically pleasing denture. So I usually utilize something called the alma gauge. As you can see here, I placed the incisal pin in the, on the right-hand side, the incisal pin right into the papilla area on the, in the base plate. I'll come out about eight to 10 millimeters on the front of the papilla. And then I'll place, uh, and I'll, I'll place my centrals and I'll start sending my denture teeth. And I go on average of about 22 millimeters from the periphery of the upper to the incisal edge of the denture tooth. So we're setting our denture teeth and now we're ready. We set our anterior teeth and we're ready to set our posterior teeth. We want to pick out the correct occlusal scheme. We want to determine the degree of the tooth, and we want to follow, if possible, follow the mold chart. But usually on these types of cases, what I'm doing, I'm using lingualized occlusion. So 
utilizing lingualized occlusion, and we're going to talk a little bit, a bit about that in a few minutes. So pretty much the lingualized occlusion is when that lingual cusp goes into the center of the upper, goes into the central fossa of the lower, creating any off, uh, eliminating any off-axis stress. So usually the, the smaller the ridge, the, the less degree of tooth, and the greater the ridge, the greater the degree of tooth. And uh, that's, that's pretty much been the rule for setting the posterior teeth. We want to apply the occlusal surfaces towards the cranium if we're using, utilizing centric occlusion. Uh, if I'm not using utilizing centric occlusion, I'm utilizing uh, lingualized occlusion, I don't have that curve of Wilson that you see on the left-hand side here. I'm going to have a curve of, curve of speed, but no curve of Wilson. Why? Because I want those, uh, the, the forces of those uh, lingual uh, uh, cusps on those upper teeth to come right down on the implants and on the ridge so we don't have any of those, uh, those uh, off-axis stresses that uh, creates implants to fail. Okay, so this is central, uh, central occlusion here. We, we make sure that the actual inclination of the posterior is the center of the cranium, and we follow the guidelines of setting our denture teeth and make sure the central fossa of the teeth are on the ridge on the lower, Check our vertical inclination of the posterior teeth. Check our curve of speed and our curve of Wilson. A little review here. From buccal to lingual is your curve of Wilson, and from anterior to posterior is your curve of, curve of speed. And we're going to eliminate that curve of Wilson when we're sending, setting our, um, our lingualized occlusion. We want harmonious transition to the posteriors, and we want a nice individualized setup that's going to look natural. And there's your finished uh, wax up. I do a nice characterized wax ups that makes, that makes it look natural looking uh, when you're trying these in the, in the patient's mouth. Let's touch on lingualized occlusion for a second. So with lingualized occlusion, I mentioned before, you know, uh, the lingual cusp is going to the central fossa of the lower denture, um, and it's a reduction of lateral side-to-side -side forces on the implant. Lateral forces could cause the implant to fail. I set those buccal cusps on the upper, uh, I flare them out slightly, it pushes away the cheek so there's no cheek biting, and also helps to redistribute those forces evenly. And of course, I'll do a nice wax drying like I talked about before. So uh, I get kind of crazy with my waxes, but I like, I like it to look natural when I, we send it out, out to the uh, dental office. So the patient can expect what that final denture is going to look like just by looking at the wax, wax drying. All right, so step five, everything looks good. We, we, we uh, try in the wax trying, we check the exclusion, aesthetics, and phonetics. Then uh, we're ready to build the denture. And we, set up the, uh, we send the putty index and the setup and soft tissue model to the milling facility. And there's your putty index of the, uh, uh, the, of the denture. And then, well, this happens to be a Nova Prosara hybrid bar that we, that we did. So they'll send me photos like this there, you know, within a week or so. And I can judge whether this, uh, it's got, we're going to have enough room, it's in the right position, and then we can give them the approval to go ahead and mill the bar. Once the bar is milled correctly, we get it back in the laboratory and, uh, and we're ready to do our, our, our final denture setup. But these are just some of the bars that are, you can choose from. We have a wraparound bar. I don't utilize these bars. Most of the time I'm using the hybrid design bar uh, or something called the Montreal bar, which I'll show in, in a few minutes. Uh, and, uh, but there's a lot of different bar choices and options. So this case comes, case comes back to the laboratory now and the bar is made and we wanna transfer the wax try-in uh, to the implant bar. And what I'll do at this point, I'll take that existing denture setup and with the bar off the model and I'll make a putty index. So instead of making a buckle putty index, I'll actually make an occlusal putty index. So I'll close that articulator so those denture teeth are, are, are closing right into the lower and, um, or it could be an upper or a lower, and then I have a nice putty index. And what happens most of the time is a lot of times the denture teeth will come out into the putty index. And I'll show you what I do. At this point, I'll make sure that it's, it's, it's passive. There's nothing hitting those denture teeth. I screw the bar onto the model. I put molten wax in there and I'll close the articulator. And when I open the articulator, all the teeth are on the bar. And I just wanna make sure I, I knew when I, I drew these little lines on the model here, as you could see, so I know where my access holes are. So I only put two, uh, two screws back in there. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna clean up the, uh, the um, wax up. I'm gonna drill access holes through those teeth and we're gonna send it back to the dental office for a try -in. So this is the case after everything's in waxed, we clean it up, open those ac access holes and we'll send it back for the final try -in. And there's your final wax up on the bar. Everything looks good. We're ready to process the case and, and then uh, we're good, uh, good to go. This particular case here on the left-hand side, this is that Montreal bar. I do the same procedure with this. 
This is the final wax up on it, right hand side. But the Montreal bar, we, mark, we have more of a finished lingual uh, 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 on, the, on the upper or the lower. And um, instead of that uh, acrylic going on the, on the uh, tissue surface of the bar, we have metal. So there's the Montreal bar. One of my favorite bars is the Montreal bar. I like it. It's clean, it's easy, and it's, it's, it's a lightweight uh, material, and it works out very nicely. And of course, at this point, we went through all this trouble uh, you know, with these bars and making everything look aesthetic. I use um, a masking material or a veneering material or a peg material to cover the bar. And this is a traditional processing method I used. And I use something called VMLC Flow. And it comes in various shades, so you can actually pretty, match, pretty much match the acrylic you're utilizing in the processing. I cover it with VMLC, I, I cure it, and I'm ready to process the case. This way, we don't see that metal or that metal bar coming through the hybrid case. And I, I, I want to. I'm going to get into dental process, dent, denture processing, in just for about two minutes here. But as you can see, you don't see any of the metal showing through this bar. This is a complicated case too. You can see how far posteriorly on that right hand side that the implant was. We had a, we utilized all the denture teeth here, molars and, and premolars. And um, here's another case here, which is showing the um, opaqueing of the bar. Denture processing techniques, there's a lot of process, processing techniques out there. I use the injection technique most of the time and or a microwave technique. And uh, many times we're utilizing the IVA based system for that. Uh, or if we can utilize heat cure processing traditional way, the traditional way also. But let's see, what are we looking for in denture bases? We've talked about this before. We, you know, we go, we're going through all these processes here and we wanna make sure every, every material we use is gonna create a successful final case. So we're looking for something with a natural look, low shrinkage factor, an acrylic that has a variety of gingival shades, great bond to the denture teeth, something that's impact resistance, has flexural strength, and good finishing and, and, and po polishing properties, and something that's gonna be color fit uh, and color and fit st stable. Uh, this is just one acrylic. This is Diamond D acrylic. These are some of the dentures I made uh, to, just to show some of the, 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 uh, the different shades out there. But this type of acrylic, if Diamond D could be, could be Ivoclar, some of the acrylics out there. You want something with a high impact resistance, but also flexural strength. And then after the denture is, is finished, many times the dentist will ask us to match the patient's natural gingiva. And what I'll do, I'll stain the gingival base I remove several millimeters of acrylic. I roughen the surface with the burr. I'll apply modeling liquid and apply stains, and I'll show you what I'm doing in a minute here. And I'll light final final uh, light cure on this. So here I am, step by step. I'll take that finished denture, that processed denture. I'll grind it down a little bit, roughen it up. I'll apply my gingiva stains. I'll have a, a digital photo next to my bench to look at the patient's natural gingiva, and I can match exactly what the patient has in natural gingiva. And you can just apply different layers and different stains to achieve the aesthetics that you want to achieve. And there's the final result. And there's a, there's a more dramatic result. Uh, this is a full upper and full lower denture, which is a denture-based stain, uh, highly aesthetic denture teeth. Unfortunately, we didn't get a picture of the patient smiling, so we never saw the ginger in the patient's mouth, the, the, on, on the denture in the patient's mouth. But it was, a, it was a beautiful denture that we did, and it really worked out well. I'm going to finish this up to, uh, today with this IDD, IDT article we talked about before. You know, we spoke this about, uh, Jessica mentioned this earlier. This had to be one of the most rewarding cases I ever did. And this picture that you see here, this is an 18-year-old uh, uh, person who went through life with a couple of orthodontic bands and turned to high school, actually, and a couple of denture teeth looted onto a wire. And he, has, he had a lot of problems, went through a lot, a lot of different operations. He had other problems before besides what was going on in the mouth here. And it's just a good kid, and we, we, we're trying to decide what to do with this patient. So this is an article uh, that I wrote, and uh, it was a two-part two article in IDT Magazine a few years back. But I got a call from uh, just Dr. John Merrill from the uh, Carolina Center for Oral Health. He said, Dennis, we have a problem here. We don't know what to do with this patient. And um, let me just go back here on the show. He says, you know, we, we have, the patient has a lot of problems. What kind of appliance can we do here? We can't really do implants on this case because it, it, I don't think the uh, patient can tolerate it. So I brought the case back to my lab and, and looking at the lab and I came up with an idea. You know, it took me a while. I'm looking at this case on an articulator. So what we did, I said, let's do some post and core on the anterior teeth and let's make an overdenture appliance. You know, it doesn't have to be an implant overdenture, but it is an overdenture. 
So what we did next, uh, we, we waxed up some copings with some equator attachments waxed on the top of these. We casted them, Dr. cemented them in the mouth and took the took the uh, took an impression, some impression analogs. Got this back to the lab. We put some uh, model analogs in there, report a bottle, and look at the malocclusion and look what I had to work with here. So malocclusion on the uh, by cuspids, and we had to come up with an appliance. That I, I was at my wit's end. I was trying to come up with some sort of design, and a light went off in my head. I said, I know what to do. We're going to make a, an appliance of a thermoplastic framework. We're going to apply denture teeth to this flame framework, and we're going to internally we're going to put equator attachments, and that's what we did. So I did a denture setup on here, took a putty matrix, and then I took a material called doracetal or acetyl resin. And as you can see, this denture set up here, what I did is we invested the case and we injected this framework here. And I took some of the denture teeth out when we inject, injected the case and I injected it with doracetal or acetyl resin. because so I was just worried about the forces of these on this denture and these denture teeth possibly breaking off. So these teeth here, as you can see here, these are made out of doracetal resin. So I have a nice framework here. We're going, now the next thing we're going to do is process the denture teeth onto the, onto the framework. So when I'll, before I processed the denture teeth onto the framework, I actually took some composite material and I went over the gingiva, as you can see on both of the uh, posterior regions here, and I made it look a little more natural. I wanted something that was gonna look natural and the patient was smiling. So this is the process case. So what we did, I processed the denture teeth, used acrylic resin on here, and you can see it was, it was almost like um, an overdenture here. We actually went over the patient's natural teeth, compensated for the malocclusion, we did an edge-to-edge -edge bite. I didn't want to come any more uh, forward on well, this bite uh, because uh, I was just worrying about tripping the denture. And then what I did, we cured the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, attachments into the denture. And these are Ryan 83 equator attachments. And I put a material, I was worried about oral hygiene. So what I did, I put a material called Versacryl internally. And this is like a soft reline re material which actually softens and acts like a gasket in the mouth, so inter, inter early. So everything's finished. And I remember getting a call at the, uh, I was at a dental meeting, an LMT meeting, I believe, in California. And I got a call from Dr. Merrill and said, Dennis, we're going to insert this uh, case on a Monday. We want to come in the office here. And uh, I said, definitely. After all this work, you know, we want to come in the office. I want to see what this patient looks like. I want to see how, how successful it is. So on a Monday morning, I went in the office, and patient uh, and the Dr. Merrill inserted this, this case and it was absolutely perfect. You can see Josh, this is Josh before, and this is Josh after, and completely changed his life. He said to me, he goes, uh, Mr. Urban, he goes, I thank God for what you did. He said, now I know what it feels like to have natural teeth. And the great thing about this, every, everybody chipped into this case, everybody did this pro bono. It is one of my successful, one of the most successful cases I've ever done. You know, so I'd like to show this, and it's, it's more detail in the article, the PDF that's going to, going to be sent to you. If you have any questions, you can also ask me about this case, but very successful case and uh, very proud of it. And, and uh, Josh was uh, very proud to wear that and uh, it brought his self-esteem up 100%. So, so artistry through denture technology. You know, at Dental Services Group, we're excited to offer you, the clinician, all these great options on implant dentures and to help you achieve the ultimate goal of patient satisfaction. So with that, I'd like to thank, first of all, thank everybody for being with us today, and, but I'll take whatever questions there are, you, you have uh, if we have some time. Thanks again. Thank you, Dennis. And you could just see the beaming eyes and smile on Josh. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, was, it was a reward case. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, while we're waiting for some um, questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and um, and launch the other polls really quick from the audience. If you don't mind, um, in your experience with, uh, oh, it won't load up. Oh, there it goes. In your experience with hybrid type cases, do you feel more comfortable with four implants or six implants on the maxillary? In your experience with hybrid type cases, do you feel more comfortable with four implants or six implants? on the maxillary. And we don't have any responses, so I'm wondering if nobody can see it. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, Maybe not. Try relaunching it really quick. Oh, here we go. There it goes, okay. Now I see it, now I see it, yep. There we go, oh, now we've got responses coming in. Thank great, great. you for your patience. Um, 
as we all know, we're, we're all working with bandwidth congestion these days. Yeah, definitely. Oh, oh it looks like um, here I'll end the pollings just so we can get through the arrest. Looks like uh, six. comfortable with six. Nice. I agree. I agree. Thank you for that. And then let me get to your question on, you see this one? Yep. Okay, great. So when performing chair side denture conversions, would you like to have a dental technician helping in the conversion process or would you rather do it yourself? Um, when performing chair side conversions, would you rather have a dental technician helping or do you like to do it yourself? And it looks like 82% uh, like. Okay, good, we'll, we'll be there. Let us know we'll be there. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> and then we will go to the very last one. And it's which titanium milled bar have you had the most success with? Which titanium milled bar have you had the most success with? Let's let this go for a little bit. And going. Uh, looks oh. like it's mixed between Nobel and Zimmer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And both of those, are, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, I'm pretty much uh, equal success. You know, I've never had a problem with a remake. I have to say, honestly, remake on a Nobel or a Zimmer bar. <laughs> so, and Panthera does beautiful work, too. I shouldn't say that, you know. So, uh, but uh, I like that, uh, that, that poll there. Thank you very much for that information. I am unmuting um, Samuel, if you can unmute from your end. I see your hand is raised that you might want to ask a verbal question. And maybe not. Um, if there aren't any other uh, further questions and comments, um, Dennis, we thank you so much for your wealth of information and I'll leave you to give the final grading. Well, thank you. Again, I just uh, appreciate everybody being on board today. And uh, just, you know, we couldn't go uh, totally into depth on everything. I just wanted to give you an overview on the on these uh, overdentures and implant uh, and the implant protocol on uh, hybrid and, and overdentures. Uh, but if you have any questions, you have my, e my email address from the previous uh, slide here. So uh, uh, it's durban at dentalservices.net. Uh, and I'm here to support you. So if you have any questions, I hope you had a positive learning experience today. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you and have a great day and stay safe.